Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I look outside here, and it's just a beautiful sunny day here. It's supposed to be up uh, in the mid-60s today. Beautiful spring day. And it's so odd because everything looks just like normal, normal outside, but it isn't normal at all. Uh, what a strange time to be living uh, in for all of us. I hope you're all safe and well today. I very much appreciate your joining uh, Nancy and I uh, today here. Um, I sometimes am at a loss for words in the midst of this, knowing um, even what to say about it. It's, it's um, unprecedented, unprecedented in our lifetime. I know I've been looking at the CDC sites and, and um, I've been trying to stay away from the news. Yesterday morning, I watched a bunch of news and some of it was good news, but a lot of it was just bad news and there's already enough bad news in the world. And then to have this pandemic on top of it, it's overwhelming some days for all of us. I hope that you are uh, watching your mind, that you are renewing your mind, that you're focusing on whatever is honorable, whatever is true, whatever is pure. If there is any excellence, think on these things. Um, always helps us when we place our mind on the good things, on truth. So let's begin with prayer today. Kind and gracious Father, I just uh, thank you for this day, for life today, that we get to live today. Thank you that you have given us a unique DNA, each one of us. You have knit us together while we were yet in our mother's womb. And that we are wonderfully made, incredibly made, Lord. We, we reflect your image, the image of God. We speak, we can perceive that things are good. Uh, we make, we create all the things that we see you doing. Uh, we, in like manner, in lesser manner, uh, can do similar things, Lord. Thank you for giving us such honor that we are made in your image. But also I thank you that we are being remade into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. And this comes from the Lord, who is your spirit. So once again, I pray for everyone listening and for those who will yet be listening later via YouTube that you would fill all of us with an extraordinary measure of your spirit, with a great measure of your spirit. We think big and we ask big, Lord. Um, we just pray for that incredible uh, indwelling presence of your spirit, the fruit of the spirit blossoming in our life, the gifts of the spirit operational in our life as you have measured them out to us. Father, I pray for uh, all of the people in our churches, in our covenant churches and in the churches of those listening. This is a time of challenge for us, a time of God asking us to trust you all the more, Lord. Uh, you don't have us here to harm us. You have us here to grow deeper. You have us here to learn more. You have us here to trust you, even when there, when when heaven se sometimes seems silent, Lord. Um, I pray that you would deepen our walk with you, that you would deepen our faith, our trust, our belief in you, that you would deepen our very clear understanding and knowledge that we are but earthen vessels, that we are weak in ourselves, that we are not God, that we are not put together, that we are but bits of clay who are now being fired in the fires of your love, fashioned into simple vessels of earth and clay that hold your broken body and your shed blood, that we might be an offering to the world around us. Thank you for your good spirit's work in our life. Thank you for the conviction that you bring when we wander from your path. Thank you for the discipline that you bring into our lives, the discipline of the Holy Spirit, that, that discipline or that self-discipline, which isn't self-disciplining ourselves, but your spirit disciplining our lives. But also that discipline comes like a father with a son or daughter who disciplines us not out of anger, but out of love to bring us back onto the path. Thank you that you love us more than we can ever know. Thank you for an eternity of grace that we are going to be coming to know you, Lord. More and more, 
a deeper and ever deeper understanding of your grace shown to us in kindness in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for the hope of heaven. Thank you that this earth is not our home. We are but sojourners here. We are but passing by. We are but a vapor here in the morning and gone by the afternoon. And yet our true home, our true dwelling is in heaven. And one day we will be rejoined with all those who have gone on before us by grace and through faith in Jesus Christ. And we will join that throng in praise of you, for we, we shall see you face to face. Our Lord Jesus Christ, always with us, never leaving us. Father, I pray for the world today. All around is pristine mountains and trees and deserts and valleys and fields and plains, untouched by the virus. It's only human beings and some birds that are, are touched by this. But your creation all around us still groans. Even it's in its majestic beauty, it speaks of you and your incredible creative ability, Lord, to create such beauty. And we perceive that beauty just as you saw that it was good. We look and we see that it's good. And so, Father, the world is in hurt today. The world that you love is hurting today, Lord. And so we cry out with one voice to you that you would deliver us from this pandemic, that you would show us mercy and grace. But, Father, more than our requests, we pray that your will would be done, whatever that sovereign, divine will of yours is. Not as we will, but as you will, Lord. Do your good work in the world. Convict the world of sin. Convict the world of unrighteousness. Uh, convict those who say there is no God. Let them know your presence and the reality of your power and might and that you are indeed God, enthroned on the throne of grace and enthroned on the throne that will one day be a throne of judgment. Let the world turn to you, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon the world in extraordinary measure, Lord upon our churches, upon all those who attend our churches, on the communities that surround our homes, on the cities that within which we live, the counties, the states, and the country, and all the countries around the world. Bring those kings and leaders and presidents and uh, chairmen and so on of nations who act unjustly and who, who persecute the righteous. I pray that you would bring them to their knees I pray that you would not do this to harm them, but you would bring them to their knees so that they may know who you are, that they may entrust their life to you. We pray this for our own leaders, for President Trump, for Nancy Pelosi, for Mitch McConnell, for their spouses and their families, their extended families, for all the senators and all the representatives in the House, and all of the same of, for the governors and the senators and the state senators and state representatives in the house all around this nation we pray that we pray first and foremost that you would lead them into a saving knowledge of our lord jesus christ that you would show kindness to them that you would uh, bring them by your power to an understanding to a change of mind about themselves their pride their sin their rebellion their selfishness but also about you your kind and immeasurably, immeasurable loving heart, Lord. And then secondly, we pray that you would give them wisdom beyond their own capacities to rule well in this time, to make decisions for the good of their um, countries and for the good of the, our country and our states. We're in an odd year, Lord, because this is a political year, a, an election year when everything is traditionally completely politicized, uh, partisan politics at its worst. And yet, Father, I pray that you would unite us as a nation, not just over the pandemic, Lord, but you would unite us as a nation in crying out to, to the Lord. We can't do this, Lord. All we can do is ask. 
And so we ask that you would do a mighty move of your spirit across our country and around the world. Whatever it takes, Lord. Not our will. Not our will, Lord. Not our requests. Not our entreaties or supplications. Not our heart's cry. But Father, your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. Amen. Again, I just wanted to thank you for uh, joining Nancy and uh, me today. My mom is having struggle with uh, restless leg syndrome today, so she's in her bedroom uh, trying to weather that. It can be uh, very, very difficult, as some of you know. I know that. Um, I've had it from time to time, and it's uh, miserable when you have it. There's a lot of maladies that we uh, continue to uh, face, even though uh, beyond the pandemic. And so my prayer also for all of you is that you are um, finding solace in, in God, that you are finding solace in the Good Shepherd, uh, who makes us lie down in green pastures, who makes us stay home for a rest, who leads us beside still waters. Uh, I'm so thankful to the Lord. He is faithful. He is good. He never lies. He always keeps his promises. And in him, we can put our trust. Today, we come to Psalm 11, and it's also attributed to David uh, in the heading in the first verse. Um, and uh, it's another psalm in, in line with 9 and 10. And so let's read it first, and then I'll give you um, a meditation on it afterwards. Psalm 11, for the choir di director, a psalm of David, and I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible today. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to the mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow, they make ready the arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. And the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. So again, this is a, a Psalm of David. As to the, the setting of it, um, you kind of get this idea that he is in danger of being killed uh, by those archers. We don't know if that's metaphoric or literal. Um, in, again, in David's day, Hebrew people used uh, poetry, and uh, the Hebrew language is very much a pictorial language, so, so they tended to think in terms of pictures, and so that picture of an archer coming after David. Um, some people think that this is referring to him, him escaping Saul, which the story is found in Samuel chapter, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18 through 22. I, I read it this morning. It's a great story. Um, if you want something to do uh, while at home, read Samuel chapter 1, 18 through 22, or even you can go into 23. Um, it's the story of uh, Jonathan and David making a covenant and then uh, them testing out Saul's intent and David fleeing, going to the, uh, uh, he escapes to the house of, I forget how to pronounce his name, Athiar, well, we, he's the high priest or the priest, and he goes to his house or to the temple and uh, eats of, takes uh, some of the consecrated bread and flees with uh, Goliath's sword. And as a result, Saul has that priest along with 85 other priests killed uh, by Doeg the Edomite. What, what a story. Saul is falling more and more into such evil. Um, some people think that this is Psalm in reference to that. 
Other people think it's in reference to the story of Absalom, which we've all already seen in an earlier psalm. Um, that story of Absalom turning against David and coming after him with the sons of Israel, with the armies of Israel, and David defeats them, the seasoned old grizzly warrior with his uh, incredible band of guerrilla warriors um, fighting in the woods. They, uh, but Bimelech was no match. His armies were no match for David's. And as a result, Abimelech dies when Joab uh, spears him through with uh, three spears. Um, we don't really know which, which of those stories it has to do with. I think it's left general because it speaks to our uh, state too. So we begin with, and I've, I've translated, uh, I've put the Lord, L-O-R-D in capital letters, uh, back to Yahweh. It's the name Yahweh. The Hebrew, as I've said many times, the Hebrew people, when they would come to this most holy name of God, Instead of reading uh, the name because they were afraid of profaning it, they would read Adonai over it, which is the Hebrew word for Lord. And in Greek, it was in the Greek Septuagint, the Greek uh, Old Testament. They would read uh, Kyrios, which is Lord. But uh, the name is Yahweh. That's actually what's in the text. In Yahweh, I take my refuge. And we know that Jesus came along and says, before Abraham was born, I am referencing his, this name that he says, I am Yahweh in the mystery of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus uh, said that I am Yahweh, I am. And so in Jesus, I take refuge. In Yahweh, I take refuge. In the Trinity, I take refuge. In the midst of this pandemic, what, what a verse, right? Where is your refuge? Yeah, I'm staying wise. I mean, um, I'm staying home. I'm trying not to go anywhere along with Nancy and my mom and my, my daughter, uh, Nicole. We are staying away from other people, not just for our sakes, but so that we don't spread it to people and, and inadvertently kill other people. Um, but beyond all the th things that we can do as human beings, we put our trust in Yahweh. We take refuge in him. He is our stronghold. He is our uh, strong tower. He is the wall of fire that surrounds us, according to Jeremiah. And then he has this um, kind of response. He says, how can you say to my soul? And there's disagreement over who this is speaking to him. Is it his own thoughts? Is it the enemy uh, tempting him to flee? Is it uh, a well-meaning person, like coming from uh, knowing that Abimelech is after him or knowing that Saul is after him, who comes to him and, and says these following words. And notice the quotation. It begins here in verse 1, but it doesn't. the quotation doesn't close until the end of verse 3. So this is counsel that's been given to him. It may very well be uh, David's own mind saying to him, uh, flee as a bird to your mountain. Um, isn't the temptation uh, for us when things like this happen is to flee? Uh, when there's a uh, danger uh, in our life. I think there's a contrast here. It's, being, it's between taking refuge in Yahweh and that he is my shield, he is your shield, he is your refuge, and it's his action that will protect your life or the actions that you can do to flee to a place where you will protect your life. I'm not saying that what we're doing with this pandemic is wrong. We need to be very careful and wise. But we can't look to ourselves and to our own protection as uh, the end all of, of uh, our, our safety in this, if you will. And so in Yahweh, I take refuge. In Yahweh, you take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? So a bird is a very fragile uh, little thing. Uh, we have birds hit this uh, plate glass window and sometimes I have to pick them up and uh, put them in the dumpster because they've uh, killed themselves hitting that window. Um, it's usually when we have both windows open and that you can see right through. Um, but uh, birds are very fragile things. And so he's getting th this uh, advisor, whether it's David's own soul or whether it's a, a well-meaning advisor of him, of his telling him, you need to flee as a bird. You can't stand this onslaught. You're just a bird. Flee to your mountain. Hide out. Um, but we get the picture. Again, it's pictorial language. Flee uh, to a mountain where you can find refuge in your nest in the mountain. And why? It goes on in the next verse. For behold, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string. 
to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. To me, this is a terrifying picture uh, when you are in darkness and you think that there might be somebody out there with an arrow already on its, uh, set on its string, already pulled back, ready to let that arrow fly and strike you and kill you. Uh, that's the image here. And sometimes uh, I know this, uh, Bremerton hasn't always been the safest city to live in. We've had uh, awfully strange things happen here over the years. One time a, a man with a machete, I was on vacation, but uh, our secretary back then, Patty was in the office and she had a friend with her uh, doing the bulletin for that day. For the next day, she, it was on a Saturday. And a man came in with a uh, 24 inch machete and uh, came into the office and visited them, with them for about 20, 25 minutes, left his coat, took his machete. Uh, when I got from vacation, I couldn't, back from vacation, I couldn't believe what I heard. But uh, about three weeks or a month later, a man in uh, Seattle, a homeless man, uh, attacked somebody with a machete. And I don't know that many people who carry machetes around, so I assume it was the next, uh, same person. But I've had people run up to the church in the office. I've had uh, somebody come into our house here and start getting violent to the point where I had to literally uh, uh, grab the person around the waist. My little girls were here and had to force them out of the house. So when I go over to church at night, for a long time, I carried my Japanese kendo stick because we had a man here in Bremerton who was stabbing people. He stabbed and killed or killed two people and uh, injured a third. Uh, one, one of the uh, people's homes, uh, one of the women who was killed, uh, we can see her home from our bedroom. It was just uh, within a block and a half of us. And they never caught the fellow. And so for years, I carried a Japanese sword over. Uh, it's a frightening thing to think that there might be somebody in the darkness waiting for you uh, to shoot in the darkness at the upright in heart. The upright in heart are the ones who stand straight and tall. They are straight speaking, straight talking. When they give their word, they keep their word. Uh, they stay on the path of righteousness. That's the idea here. And then going on, it says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And you see the quote, the closing of the quotes here. So these verses, Flee as a bird to your mountain, for behold, the wicked bend the bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The, this, the, that whole uh, three verses is on the lips of this would-be counselor of David, whether it's the enemy, whether it's David's own thought life, uh, beckoning him to not trust in God, but to trust in his own devices and or a counselor, a, a well-meaning counselor of David who's coming to him to give him advice or advice, just like uh, Job had his counselors trying to give good advice when it was really bad advice. And uh, uh, this phrase, if the foundations are destroyed, a foundation is what keeps a building solid. Uh, when this house was built that we're in, in 1957, they were on the last cement pour of the foundation when the cement truck backed up too far and he hit the, the foundation so hard uh, the, that had already been poured that it cracked it all the way around. It ruined the foundation. So instead of uh, excavating that whole foundation out, what they did was they poured a second foundation around the whole house. So this house has a very thick foundation. We discovered it when we were removing the driveway. It was a, a, a Boeing 747 could have landed on the driveway if it was big enough. It was that thick. It was over 16 inches thick of concrete. Um, but if the foundations are destroyed, so what foundations is David talking about here, or this would-be counselor talking about? It's when a society so falls apart morally and justice is uh, no longer reigning in a land. For David, it could have been uh, during the time of Saul, when Saul's rule had eroded into killing the priests, coming after David, who had so faithfully served him uh, with death and vengeance and threat. Or it could have been uh, during the time of Abimelech when Abimelech stole the hearts of the Israelites from David and had the armies of Israel come against their own king. That's such a time when the foundations are destroyed. In our time, I think the foundations are or have been destroyed, the, the moral foundations of our society. We've turned everything that God has told us to do or not to do, and we've turned it on the head. We're calling good evil and evil good. In in so many ways, uh, fornication, uh, it's even in the church now, it's ramp, rampant, uh, adultery, um, divorce, uh, which uh, I know many of you have been divorced and I'm not 
condemning you. In Christ, there is now no condemnation. But yet, God doesn't desire for people to be, be divorced. That's not his plan. Um, and in so many other ways, we have turned our back on God. The foundations are destroyed. Stealing is rampant. Lying. Uh, several years ago, a study was done of college gra gra graduates who had recently graduated, and they uh, confessed to, or on this uh, secret, um, uh, what is it called, a uh, survey. Um, on the survey, they asked them, how many of you cheated your way through school? And over 50% of the graduates cheated their way through school. So now all those graduates are, are out in the world, and you can, can't imagine that that's happened with every uh, class since. And do you want a, a nurse who, who cheats and lies? You want a doctor who, who cheats and lies? You want a banker who cheats and lies? Uh, the, the foundations of a society crumble when we give up honesty, when we give up truth, when we give up this uh, moral standard that God has for us that never changes. It's beyond the law. It's beyond the Ten Commandments. It's uh, found in the command to love as God, as Jesus has given himself up for us and loved us. Um, it's a very stringent uh, moral standard. And yet it's one that when we live in it, it is full of joy and full of peace. If the foundation are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And so this counselor is telling David, look at the foundations are destroyed. What can you do? Just flee. Uh, some people want to leave the country. Some people. And David's argument essentially is against this. In Yahweh, I take refuge. I'm not going to listen to this counsel. I'm not going to uh, be swayed because the, because the foundations are destroyed. Do you feel like the foundations in our country have been destroyed or are being destroyed as we speak? What can the righteous do? Hmm. He turns now to Yahweh, to the Lord. Yahweh is in his holy temple. Yahweh's throne is in heaven. And so this is David. This is before the temple was built. So he's not talking about an earthly temple. He's talking about the real thing. The temple on earth was just a, a shadow of the real thing, just a type of the real thing. So when it says that Yahweh is in his holy temple, it's talking about that throne in heaven where he rules, from, where, from whence he rules. Yahweh's throne is in heaven. And from that throne, it says, he, his eyes behold. His eyes behold, and it's left uncategorized, unspecified, which means he beholds everything. There's nothing that, is, that escapes his notice. The smallest word that escapes from our lips, the thoughts in our minds. Uh, this is kind of like, hmm, not good news in, in of itself. And then it says his eyelids test the sons of men. I couldn't figure this out. I did some reading, and it means... He squints at us. You know when you're, you're evaluating something, you go. And so his eyelids test the son of, sons of men, meaning um, sons and daughters here. We're not being uh, patriarchal. This is both about men and women. His eyelids, he, he beholds us. He looks at us and he tests us. The next verse says, Yahweh tests the righteous and the wicked. And so he tests both of us. And yet I think there is a different sense to how he tests us. To those who are righteous in the blood of Christ. It's not a test to see if you uh, stand or fall, if you fail or succeed. It's a test that's meant, to in, that's meant to strengthen your faith. It's a test that's meant to strengthen your um, taking refuge in God. It's a test that's strengthening your belief. It's a, it's a test that makes us aware of our own weakness and has us look to the strength of God and to his power. Such a time we are living in now, this pandemic is such a time where we are being tested as the righteous, as those who are righteous in Christ. We are being tested not to see if we can hold up. Some days I I'm, I'm, don't pass that test but we are being tested to know that he is trustworthy, that we can trust him in all circumstances. Uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
Sometimes we relegate that to meaning I can do anything I put my mind to because Christ is going to help me. That's not the context at all. It's literally, I have learned the secret of, of dealing in, in wealth or in plenty and in, har in hardship, in, in want. Uh, I have learned the secret of contentment. And the secret is I can, I can do all things through Christ. And so what it's getting at is I can face all circumstances I find myself. You can face all circumstances you find yourself in through Christ who strengthens us. So the strength doesn't come from you. The strength doesn't come from me. This would-be advisor was saying, rely on your own strength. Flee to the mountains. You are nothing. You are weak. What can you do when the foundations of, of righteousness and justice and morality have fallen from a society? Trust in yourself. Flee. Hole up in your, in your house. Well, we, we are needing to do that now. But hole up in your kingdom mentality in the church. No. God is doing his good work even through this. By his spirit, he is continuing to transform our life from one degree of glory to another. As uh, we've been seeing in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, now, the, uh, let's see, for we uh, have this uh, treasure in earthen vessels to show that this transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. Therefore, we have this treasure in earthen vessels in these weak earthen vessels, to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. We are carrying about in our life, in our bodies, the death of Jesus. Do you know that? I know it in my life right now full well. And so in the midst of this affliction, in the midst of this wine press we find ourselves in, Yahweh tests the righteous and the wicked. He puts the wicked to the test. And the one who loves violence, his soul hates. So oftentimes we say uh, God loves the, the sinner but hates the sin. No, he, here it says, and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. The one who goes after violence. Uh, we have a greater revelation in in the New Testament where God where God's uh, where John says uh, maybe quoting Jesus for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever should believe in, in him should not perish but everlast but have everlasting life have eternal life for God so loved the world but he does hate violence he hates violence uh, and it, it means unjust violence, where a nation or a people or a person goes after killing other people and hurting other people without cause. He hates violence. His whole soul hates it. So he's testing us today. You're being tested today in the midst of this pandemic to strengthen your faith, to strengthen your resolve, to strengthen your trust that God that Yahweh is able, that Yahweh is sufficient, that his grace is sufficient, that his strength is enough. He who threw out the heavens as if they were but sand, Orion and Cassiopeia and the Pleiades and the Big Dipper. He who holds the heavens can measure the vastness of the heavens as we know it, can measure it in the expanse of his, or in the width of his palm, we serve an enormous God, and in him we can put our trust. Upon the wicked, he will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. So I have a, it, my phone shut off on me, um, but upon the wicked, he will rain snares. And I was wondering, what, what does the word snares mean? It, it's a bird trap, a, a trap or a snare. So literally, it's a bird trap. He's going to rain bird traps on us. Well, that's not what it's talking about. Uh, the, fi figuratively, it meant calamities, plots, uh, agent of calamity. So a calamity, something that's a ferocious, a hard time, a pestilence, fire and brimstone and burning wind. Now we understand what those snares are. He explains them. It's fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion 
of their cup, those who hate or those who show violence, who love violence. Get that, those who love violence. Fire and brimstone, bringing up the image of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, cities that were so involved in such evil that God destroyed the cities down to where we can't even find the cities anymore. Uh, fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of the, their cup. In other words, God will destroy those who love violence. Is there a chance that these people can come to Christ, be persuaded that he is the son of God, that he is the Messiah who came to save us from our sins? Of course. Uh, we live in a new covenant where that offer is made to the most vile of men, to the most vile of women. And so, but God is a God of justice. I'm thankful for that. I hope you're thankful for that. One day, all things will be set aright. All things will be made right. All those who have been afflicted, who have been used of men and of women, who have been mistreated and abused uh, physically and sexually and emotionally and, and uh, psychologically, God is on your side. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. And one day he will mete out justice. And our only hope is not in ourselves, not to flee to, our, to the mountain or in our own righteousness, but to look to Yahweh. He is our refuge. And then it closes with, for Yahweh is righteous, for Yahweh himself is holy. He is absolutely uh, perfect in his character this incredible loving God we have who never veers from his love. Even his wrath is an outcome of his love. You know, you're only angry, really angry with people uh, who you dearly love. I can be uh, angry at other people, but I'm most angry at those I love when they do something wrong, right? Especially when it's something uh, wrong to me or vice versa when I have wronged them and I justly deserve their anger. Anger is a language of love. For Yahweh is righteous. He loves righteousness. He loves uh, the straight path, those who stand straight and tall, those who live a holy life, a consecrated life, a, a life in right relationship with him. The upright, those who are righteous, those who stand tall will behold his face. This is under the old covenant still. And so I hear that and I go, well, according to this, I'm lost. And so are most of you or all of you. But again, as from yesterday, we read those words from Romans 3, 10 through 18. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. Um, together, we have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. There is no one righteous, not even one. And so who is there left to love? And so how do we, how do we come, become righteous? It's not through our own effort. It's not through our own strength. It's not fleeing, uh, looking to ourselves as if we were God. It's looking to Yahweh. He is our refuge. And so I think of three scriptures. The first one is found later in uh, 2 Corinthians. And it's chapter 5. It's in the next uh, chapter that, from which we're studying on Sundays. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's a lot of pronouns in him. In, in, in him, there's a lot of pronouns in this verse. So sometimes a little bit difficult to sort it out. So I put the pronouns in, took the pronouns out and I actually put who they're referring to back in. And so we read, God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. All of your sin, every sin you've ever committed, every sin I've ever committed, Jesus became that sin, became the sin of the entire world. For God so loved the world to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in, in Jesus. How does that happen? Well, when Jesus became the sin of the whole world, when he took on our sin and took on the just penalty of the sin and the curse of the law against our sin, when he died, the world's sin died with him. The world is forgiven. We're not acquitted yet. We're not justified. That only comes through our receiving the gift of life, through calling out to Jesus, save me, through being persuaded that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, 
to believe in Jesus, to put our trust in him. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God, that we might become the moral health of God. Boy, does this one come true for me, because I lost both of my parents to cancer. Cancer is the reality of one cell deciding that it's going to make the body after its own image, remake the body after its own image. So it starts changing the cells next to it into its own image, and gradually it kills itself by killing the body. Uh, it's literally killing, uh, it's destined to kill itself. In, in the same way, I have cancer right now, four, stage four cancer. I have this cell that's trying to replicate itself throughout my body until hopefully it'll be many, many years, but one day it may kill me. Um, what a perfect picture of sin and rebellion, that we are about making the world after our own image, that we go after our own way, that we are, we care could care less about the health of the society and community and body around us. We want it, it our way, and we want it our way now. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. Notice where that righteousness comes from, in Jesus, and what he did for us on the cross. And then from 1 Corinthians, we go back one book to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 31. I'm not going to read the whole context. I love this context, starting in verse 26. You can read it later, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. But by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. By whose doing? Your doing? Are you in Christ Jesus because of your doing? Now, this clearly says, but by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. It's all of grace, all of his undeserved, unmerited, kind and generous power to forgive save and transform broken and sinful lives forever. But by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. So Jesus is our wisdom. If you need wisdom, go to Christ. And righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. Nothing to do with our, ourselves. He is our righteousness, and it comes to us as a gift from God. And sanctification. That's the process of being made righteous, of being made holy. And Jesus is our sanctification. You don't sanctify yourself. He sanctifies you, both once and for all at the cross and in the working out of it in our daily life. Jesus is our sanctification. And redemption. He purchases us from the slave market of sin and death and slavery to the, to the devil. He purchases us out of that by his shed blood, and then he sets us free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery speaking of the yoke of the law and of all the fence laws surrounding it. For freedom, Christ has set us free. We have been set free of religion, folks. Do you get that? We live in this radical friendship with our Lord Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and with the Father. We've been asked to come into a dance with him, this radical dance of love, where he leads and we follow. And it's a dance of joy and of peace and of uh, exaltation and jubilee. And so we've been redeemed, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. When you know that we are in Christ because of God's doing, that Jesus has made our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification and redemption, what's left for us? Our boast is completely in Jesus and in what he's done, completely in the Father for sending the Son, completely in the Spirit who is transforming our life even now as we speak by the power uh, in us from one degree of glory to another. And then lastly, from Philippians 3, 8, and 9, these remarkable words, following that, where Paul has just given his credentials, his pedigree, and he says, I count that all loss. More than that, I count all things to be lost, all things to be lost, in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, count them but dung, count them but crap, so that I may gain Christ. That's that literal word there. Shocking. And may be found in him. And may be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own. And being found in him. Not having a righteousness of your own. Derived from the law 
following the dictates of the law, following the commandment of the law, the Ten Commandments, following the law boiled down to its essential matter, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's still the law boiled down to its essential ingredients, and to its essential character, to its essential matter. Not having a righteousness derived from the law of my own. I, I, I can't do it. But that which is through faith in Christ, that which is through trusting Christ, that which is through believing Jesus, and then get this, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Same word as trust, on the basis of trust. I think we've so spiritualized the word faith now, we have a hard time hearing that it just means trust. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of trust. So who are the upright in heart? Who are the righteous that, that God loves? He loves the whole world but he certainly loves those who have entrusted their life into his hands. And so if I take the first and last verse of this uh, psalm, then it gives us wonderful instruction, even in the midst of this pandemic. In the Lord, I take refuge. In Yahweh, you take refuge. For Yahweh is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. Those of us who have been washed in the blood of Christ, those of us who have washed our robes, our character in the blood of Christ, we're the upright, not in of ourselves, but as a gift of God. How do you receive that gift? For the wage of, of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It's a free gift. You receive a gift by receiving it. You receive a gift by believing the one who offers a gift. Again, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Or again, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. She does not come into judgment, but has already passed, is, is a sense of it, from death to life. Who are the righteous? Those who have, been, who have entrusted their very lives into the hands of Jesus those who have believed in Jesus. Amen? So, in the midst of this day, remind yourself, in the Lord, I take refuge. In the Lord, I take refuge. May that be your affirmation today. Say it several times out loud to each other. In the Lord, in Yahweh, I take refuge. Or even better yet, in Jesus, I take refuge. In Jesus, I take refuge. Amen? Well, thank you for joining me today. Tomorrow we'll be doing Psalm 12, uh, Good Friday. And I'm going to just continue with the Psalms. Um, Psalm 12 and noontime prayer beginning at uh, 1055 with that countdown. So you have time to connect. Or I'm sorry, 1155 uh, tomorrow. And then we will uh, pray and then uh, read through that Psalm and also have a meditation following. Again, thank you for joining me today. It's wonderful to have you. I never know who's out there until after I look afterwards because uh, I can't see the comments you're making or that you're here. But I'm glad you're here with us. And for all of those who will be watching later, thank you for the honor that you show me in, in listening to my words and to listening to the word of God. I pray that this has enriched you today. In Yahweh, we take refuge. Let's pray. Father, again, I just uh, thank you for these uh, straightforward words in the psalm that you love righteousness and you hate those who love violence. But Father, I thank you that you so love this world that anyone can call out to you and be saved. So Lord, be in our day. Surround us with uh, the protection that comes uh, from you, Lord. Be our shield, a shield about us. Be that wall of fire. Be that strong tower. Be, a, be our bulwark against the fo foe, Lord protect us from the virus. And Lord, we pray our request is that you would bring this pandemic quickly to an end. And at the same time, we pray, yet not as we will, but as you will, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for coming, and I hope to see you tomorrow. From 1 Timothy 
chapter 6, verses 15b to 16. He who is blessed and oh, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen.